went to the depot to carve my name. Agent saw me, but I finished just the same. He got excited, got mad as hell. Into a fight we got, into the ground we fell. We rolled and rolled, a rough and tumble fight. A tramp and ticking agent late that night. I lived near tracks. I've always been a history fan. So I got into a little bit of railroad history. And I would, I would often watch graffiti pass by. And I always found it fascinating. And uh, just as I got older, I, uh, I, I found out about uh, historic graffiti that seemed to have you know, been lost in time to some degree. I realized that, yeah, you can, you can study and you can, you can write a thesis or do a project on something that maybe to the average person might at first glance seem sort of trivial, but there's actually a deeper rooted history. General history, art history, railroad history, uh, there's an anthropological side, even an archaeological side, sociology, there's a political element to it, of course. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to bring a, sort of all these sort of uh, disciplines together to sort of, you know, write the history about uh, why and how they used graffiti as a form of communication. The graffiti I'm talking about, that's known as monikers, it started uh, shortly after uh, the American Civil War, when people started using the railroad to travel across uh, both Canada and the United States, but um, the free mode of travel. Many of them did it as a form of communication inter interculturally uh, within the subculture, uh, sort of just to be, to tell one another that they're, they're around. Often they would camp near, um, near water tanks because that's where steam engines would stop. So uh, monikers were typically placed in the uh, water tanks and sometimes been referred to as the Hobo Yellow Pages. It was the place to check when you entered a, a town or a city to see who was, who was hanging about. A lot of the graffiti that you, you typically associate with hobos are these cryptic symbols. And there are conflicting accounts of what symbols mean. I like to call them a like little compact biography where the name is typically a nickname, which is another relation to perhaps modern graffiti as well. A date, uh, typically the direction that they're going with an arrow pointing, perhaps the color of their hair as a descriptor, uh, their, the size of their body, whether they were slim, skinny, that kind of thing, uh, what, where they're from. Blinky Smith, Dopey Benny, Chicago Red, Oklahoma Slim. Whatever they had available to them, they would, uh, they would use to create these markings. Carvings, uh, paint, shoe polish, uh, pencil even. Something that they would often, or not often, but at times, since they were resourceful, carve into uh, concrete with uh, railroad spikes, which is one that may have fallen down or maybe it's been sitting here for a long time. We have no idea. Hobos and tramps are, of course, uh, interesting characters in that they're, they're subverting society, so that says a lot about them. There's a lot of folklore surrounding them, and there's a lot of uh, misinformation. They are, of course, uh, consistently hiding from the public in a lot of ways. A lot of the information that they did give, or a lot of information that we do know, comes from them, which they're a community known to sort of embellish, uh, give tall tales. It was definitely a risk doing this. Both uh, hopping trains generally is a very dangerous thing. Uh, but graffiti as well, it was just as it is today, it's often frowned upon. So many of them would get caught by the railroad police known as bulls. So it's another location that uh, monikers were often found as well, as in jail cells. Some did it for infamy. Uh, some did it just to, you know, as that intercultural communication where it's that, uh, hey, this is where I am, like, we can keep track of one another, that kind of thing. I like using the analogy um, of New York graffiti in the 60s and 70s, which is sort of the, what birthed uh, what we know as graffiti now, um, where these, these young, typically young uh, minority kids who are sort of uh, subverting society a little bit, they soon found out that painting on the subway trains of New York, traveling around, was an easier way to become famous. So like the graffiti would travel around New York City and the, the young graffiti writers would become famous within their subculture, hobos and tramps would also do that to some degree, although their graffiti was stationary and the, they moved around themselves on the trains.
With the assistance provided by this award, I chose to travel to the States for roughly three weeks this past July. It was roughly about 10,000 kilometers over the course of three weeks. A little bit of North Dakota, Montana, Northern Idaho, uh, Pacific Northwest, like Washington State, Oregon, and down to California and back. The experience for making this journey for me was, uh, it was certainly exhausting. I covered a lot of ground. I was walking up and down a lot of steep inclines, uh, you know, ducking under a lot of bridges, doing a lot of walking and that kind of exploring, walking through raspberry bushes. My, my shins took a beating. Lots of them were uh, also just sort of hunches. Usually old infrastructure, if uh, a lot of old highways in the States, like Montana, for example, um, a lot of them have been renamed Frontage Road or that kind of thing. The following those, using even newspapers where they reference uh, locations where maybe someone is arrested in the 20s for doing it uh, in such and such county or whatever city, knowing that they were done there, uh, maybe they still exist. But it was, it was really rewarding in the sense, it was addicting as well. For every one that I found, I was excited about the next possible spot and whether or not uh, there would be something there. Crawling underneath the bridge to look up and see, uh, you know, this historic uh, marking done, you know, 60, 80 years ago was truly, uh, at times, overwhelming. In the process of uh, checking out local Saskatchewan depots as well, just to see if I could find anything. I'm not sure if it's um, just didn't quite catch on or last to the extent that it did in the United States, but most of the graffiti that I found in Canada that is perhaps hobos or, tra hobos or tramps uh, were done in a lot more simple fashion without the, perhaps like the, you know, the typical characteristics of a moniker with the, the date and the arrow and that kind of thing, or the nicknames for that matter. Under the, the train bridge here is a pier uh, with some carvings that date back to the 1910s. Uh, some are dated, some aren't. Um, whether they're hobos or tramps, it's hard to say. Um, but it is very much uh, a location where hobo or tramp graffiti would take place. As, as many of the locations are, they were uh, good places to stay out of sight, stay out of put, just as they are now. So there's often more modern graffiti here as well. July 14th, 1919, uh, several full first and last names, that kind of thing. So we have these old initials here. AFJFJK, May 24th, uh, 1927. You do develop a, a sense of what their lifestyle might be like. When I was searching myself, you're often, you know, walking the tracks, like huddling under bridges. Often there are current homeless people living there, which uh, these, these places, as they were then, they are still now, you know, tucked away. They're good places. If, you do not have a home if you, or you're you know, not participating in the society that is built. Uh, they're good places to sort of stay out of, out of the way. You kind of want to keep some of the locations sort of secretive because you don't want the, you want them to last, of course, right? So, uh, future generations can hopefully stumble upon them before they get these buildings or these structures get torn down.